Well, it's so great to be here with you. I don't actually get opportunities to speak very often, and when I do, I just want to, like, tell everybody everything I know, and I can't do that in 30 minutes. And I always want to start, like, at the beginning, you know, like when Eve met the snake in the Garden of Eden, that's when we had our problems start. And that's when the evil that is, um, that abortion is a symptom of, that's when that occurred. So I'm not going to revisit the fall of man story, but I would like to tell you that today in our world, there are a lot of very bad people doing a lot of very bad things to other people. And a lot of that, or at least the part that I have researched and most aware of, goes on inside of abortion clinics. And people don't really realize that a lot of these abortion clinics are predatory. They prey on vulnerable women, and they um, hide everything behind a veil of secrecy. Think about it. You know, they don't have to tell you anything about anything. They hide behind HIPAA. They, you know, they don't let, I mean, there's an abortion clinic in my hometown, Wichita, Kansas. If there's a suspected incident at a clinic, we've had to call the police because, like, there's one instance where a minor girl was being held against her will inside the abortion clinic. She was texting her mother, and um, the abortion clinic administrator refused to allow the police inside to do a welfare check, and the police just said, well, they don't want to let me in, uh, then that's what happens. So they are very much protected by a veil of secrecy, and... Um, Often I wonder that if people knew what I know about the abortion industry and the people that are engaged in it and what really goes on at these places, you know, um, I think a lot of people might have trouble sleeping at night because the evil of abortion is just that. It's evil and its roots are um, in just the depravity of man and the the Satan, actually. I think a lot of times there's an occultish overtone to some of the things that go on in the abortion industry, and I know that some of these people, their consciences are seared. That doesn't mean there's not hope for people to come out or whatever, but I just know that some of these people have been just so justifying their barbaric acts for so long that they can just act like it's not a big deal. You know what I mean? Why is this a big deal? Why is ripping a baby into literally a thousand pieces, as was testified in court just earlier this week um, in a malpractice case that involved a botched abortion, literally the abortionist aborted a 25-week-old baby he only opened the woman's cervix two centimeters. Ladies, you'll know what that means. It's not very far. And he had to pull this baby out in literally almost a 1,000 pieces. And so um, when he left a, half the baby's skull inside, you know, it was like, oh, not my fault. You know what I mean? So there's a big lawsuit that's going on right now. Trial's going on even as I speak. So, um, but they can justify that and act like it's the most perfectly normal thing and I think there has to be something wrong with a person's conscience in order to be able to do that. But primarily at Planned Parenthood, of course, um, not everyone is a wicked person, but there are those that will lie, cheat, steal, murder um, to advance their um, bottom line and to advance their agenda. And um, it's, it's wicked and it's evil, and that's, that is the truth. Now, um, I'm going to share a little bit of information you may find uncomfortable, but I've found that if we can't face the evil that we're battling, how can we ever hope to defeat it? So I'm just going to give you a little, you know, taste of reality. And some of you might know all this already, but I know that a lot of people really don't. But I'm just going to start here with a um, Planned Parenthood by the numbers. And um, Planned Parenthood is about abortion. I don't care what they say. I don't care what their public relations people say. I don't care what their spokespeople say, what their annual report says. Planned Parenthood is about abortion. That is the bottom line. 
Um, they run 56 local affiliates around the country, and they operate 347 facilities that conduct abortions. And um, they dominate the market of abortion by operating 49% of the facilities. So 49% of every abortion facility in this country is a Planned Parenthood. But that leaves 51% that are not Planned Parenthoods. Some of these Planned Parenthood, some of these non-Planned Parenthood abortion clinics in some ways are worse because people forget about them, you know? But there's like chains out there, they are for-profit businesses, and that is what they are in business for. It's not to help women. There's no consideration for women. There's no, definitely no consideration for the child. And their bottom line is make money, make it fast, as fast as you can. And um, those clinics are frightening, frightening, because they spend the least amount of time with every woman. They come up with, like, abort, like they, some of them use abortion drugs that are just so dangerous. They're outdated. Nobody, rep, well, I don't know if anybody reputable uses abortion drugs, but they're, um, nobody uses them except for there's this one chain um, on the East Coast here that, because it's cheap, very little overhead. It costs just pennies to administer this drug. They make more money, and that's all they care about. The fact that women suffer incomplete abortions, have to go to the hospital, and have surgical removal of the dead baby that was not expelled, they don't care about it. They don't care. They got their money. That's all they care about. But so, you know, we need to be concerned about every abortion clinic, but Planned Parenthood is probably the one we usually think about. But even though they own 49% of all abortion facilities, they only um, do 30% of the abortions. So, you know, there's a little bit of a disconnect there. They have a lot of facilities. They may not be doing as many abortions as the other 51%, the other 51%, a lot of high volume for-profit businesses out there. Now, according to Planned Parenthood's annual report, they conducted 321,384 abortions over the past year. It's a slight decrease from uh, 2015. That decrease is troubling them. It's forcing them to reorganize their business. I'll just tell you this brief little story. Several years ago, we were doing some research, and we ran across this experimental um, medication abortion um, program in Iowa. They called it telemed abortion, and they would have an abortionist sit in Des Moines at a computer screen, and he would um, have video conferences with his patients and then press a button on the, com on the computer screen that opened a little drawer, actually, that popped out in front of the woman remotely. He, it was like remote control button. Drawer popped out, abortion drugs in there. She takes the abortion drugs, goes home. They never see her again. And um, we believe this is really, really super dangerous. And we found out that they had a five-year program to put that process in every clinic they had. You know, in order to get abortions in every clinic they had, they were heavily relying on this telemed system to do that. We found out about it. We totally busted them. We went up to Iowa. We had this big campaign. And um, I can say that that was a very successful campaign. And we essentially, there was, I forget how many states it is now, like 17 states have made laws that actually ban that um, kind of remote controlled dispensing of abortion drugs. And so um, we, we wrecked their five-year program to have abortions in every one of their facilities, you know? And they still don't. They still don't. They still operate 160-some-odd um, facilities that do not conduct abortions or dispense abortion drugs. So um, their little five-year program got blown out the window. And that's just what a little bit of research and a little bit of activism can actually do. But one of the main things that I research are um, uh, medical emergencies that happen at abortion clinics. And uh, the medical emergencies are, are kind of interesting. We don't have a comprehensive list because we just ha don't have eyes on these places 24-7. And sometimes they'll wait until pro-lifers are gone 
and they'll call the ambulance, sneak them out the door. The 911 calls that say, please, 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 no lights and no sirens. They don't want to draw attention to the fact that they're sending a woman to the hospital in some life-threatening condition, because that's pretty much the only reason they really do call the ambulance. They try to downplay and say, well, she just needs to go to observation for observation. But then when we find out more details, we find out she was like hemorrhaging, she was passed out, near death, needed, you know, all these transfusions to bring her back, needed surgery, whatever. It's horrible. It's horrible. And, oh, we just need to transfer them for observation. They downplay everything. They hide and they cover up the number of women they're injuring and the number of women that they're killing. So we have found, though, that in recently in the last two or three years, it's become increasingly harder to get the 911 records that are supposed to be public. The Planned Parenthoods are going to the state and local authorities, and they're pressuring them not to release that stuff. They're threatening them with HIPAA and everything else, and, and these guys are all like, oh, HIPAA, we can't have that. You know, so then we, they've stopped um, giving 911s in a lot of places. That's um, something that we're actually dealing with. We have a little bit other things. But this particular abortion clinic on your screen is one of the worst abortion clinics. Pretty much any of the abuses you can think of, go on at this clinic. Go on at this clinic, okay? They've had multiple um, incidents. Well, you know, when we sued the fire department to get the 911 calls that were being denied us, we thought that we had 31 incidents within uh, oh, like a three, four-year period, something, I don't know what. When we actually were able to get them to release the incidents and what the woman's condition was, what she was transported for, like it was hemorrhage or, you know, reaction to anesthesia or she was having seizures, whatever it was. Um, when we finally got that list, there were actually 58 instances on it. So what we could see was only really the tip of the iceberg. There was a lot more going on that we didn't see. And um, so we found out that there were 58. It was a lot. And um, of those 58, 50 were urgent priority one emergencies that would include life-threatening conditions. Um, so women suffered, and um, they tried to cover it up. They got the fire department to go in cahoots with them to cover it up. And the, we found this. And, um, we found all this stuff out about this Missouri abortion clinic. I call it the worst abortion clinic in the country. So for years, it was the only one abortion clinic in Missouri. And um, the, there was a number of things that happened there that actually um, have changed the way politics is in Missouri and how they handle things like that. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the things that we do not have a record of, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means we don't know about it. We haven't been able to discover it. They try to cover these things up like crazy. And that is um, patient deaths. These are just two ladies that um, died from botched abortions at Planned Parenthood facilities. And Tanya Reeves, um, the one on your left was a 23-year-old mother of a one-year-old son at the time of her six-week abortion at a Chicago Planned Parenthood on July 20th, 2012. We got, there was a, some, a radio reporter that did a little blurb on the radio. It ended up on the internet and it ended up in my Google alerts in my inbox, right? So I'm like, oh my gosh, these guys report on this patient death. I can't even believe that. Well, after that, they wouldn't touch it. The whole case went silent, right? But, but thankfully, the family sued, and eventually they were able to receive, they settled with Planned Parenthood for $1.5 million for the little boy so that he would um, have support once he turned um, of age. But the abortionist, her name was Mandy Gittler, and I have the depositions from that case. I have her deposition. And you can see her just downplaying, downplaying, downplaying. That woman's life meant nothing to them. She had a uterine, hammer, a uterine 
um, perforation, and she was bleeding internally. And they let her lay in that Planned Parenthood office for five and a half hours, bleeding to death, waiting for everybody to go away, nobody to know. Then they didn't call 911, which is the fastest way to get help. They called, they bypassed that, called the ambulance company directly, got the ambulance to come and take her to the hospital. But by then it was too late. There was nothing the doctors could do. They tried to save her life, but they couldn't. She was just too far gone. And um, that woman, what happened to her was when they settled the lawsuit, Planned Parenthood had her removed from the settlement, so her name isn't on it, and then transferred her to Michigan where nobody knew about that case. So now she's still killing babies every day up at Planned Parenthood abortion clinics in Michigan. And um, it's really shocking what happens. We file complaints. We file complaints to the medical board, health department, you know, you name it. And they just say there was no standard of care breached. So we're not taking any disciplinary action. It happens over and over and over. It's like any moron can see that if the woman walks in healthy, lays her and is allowed to bleed for five and a half hours and then dies, something went wrong. That is not standard of care. You don't expect that to happen to you. You know what I mean? But they are able just to downplay, cover these things up, not in the media. It was just a terrible thing. Another one... Cree Irwin, she was one of the more recent ones. She received a first trimester abortion in Battle Creek, Michigan, at the Planned Parenthood, not Battle Creek, she lived in Battle Creek, at the Kalamazoo, Michigan Planned Parenthood. Her uterus was perforated as well. She was sent home, said, everything's fine, you're good, sent home with a prescription for a painkiller that she was never able, she was in so much pain she couldn't go to the pharmacy. So a couple of days later, she called her mom and said, I have to go to the hospital. I can't take this anymore. So her mom picked her up, took her to the hospital. The hospital heard the abortion word and said, sorry, you just have to go to plan, back to your doctor or back to Planned Parenthood. And they released her with another prescription, which she could not get filled. It was 4th of July weekend. The pharmacy in the hospital was closed. So she was in so much pain, her mother put her, took her home to her own house, put her daughter in her own bed, and um, later found her dead. And this is, you know, I didn't want to, like, cry about this. I always cry, though, because it's so close to me. I know the mother. I've had discussions with the mother. Um, Catherine, uh, Catherine Davis actually was amazing. She stepped in and helped us deal with this family. The, the brother, her brother, wants justice. He does not understand why they allowed his um, sister to die. Why was her life, in fact, he asked that, why was her life not worth saving? Why did Planned Parenthood kick her to the curb? Why did the hospital not treat her? You know, it was just this culture of cover-up, cover-up, cover-up. So I'm going to play, um, have someone go ahead and play just a snippet of the 911 court recording when the mom called because her daughter was unresponsive. just a little snippet but from that you can hear the anguish in the mother's voice that is one of the costs of abortion that is one of the costs of the cover-up is the anguish of a mother who loses her daughter from an abortion that was botched and no one wanted to take responsibility for it so we worked we continue to work with the brother um, of that family to try to get some justice. We do actually have open complaints still, but um, because the coroner came out and said that it was because of drug use that she died, I'm sorry, no drug perforates her uterus and causes internal hemorrhaging. That does not happen. But they were trying to make her, they were trying to um, ruin her reputation and make it sound like that her death was her own fault. 
you know, and the drugs that she had was because she couldn't get to a pharmacy. There was someone in her home, I guess, that was on methadone. So she took a methadone. There was a trace of methadone in her system. So they said, oh, yeah, illegal drug use. That's why she died. And it was a complete cover-up. It was a complete fabrication. And um, we hope we can get justice, and I hope that there is, their family is able to get justice, but it's not looking good after all this time because, um, you know, people look at the autopsy report and they say, well, the, the coroner says this. So they don't even question the motivation of this young female coroner who obviously had some kind of agenda. She took eight months to release that autopsy report. Most autopsy reports come out within three to six weeks. Eight months she held that, and I thought it took them eight months to come up with something that was going to cover up for Planned Parenthood. That's what it did. It took them eight months to do that. So meanwhile, plant back to Planned Parenthood, um, hurting people. The deaths are not the only things that are being covered up. Planned Parenthood is also famous for failing to report child sex abusers. Um, they frequently ignore mandatory reporting laws and abused girls are handed back to their abusers. Now, my office, we actually purchased an abortion clinic, kicked the abortionists out, and we remodeled it. It's a nice place now. When we bought it, it was not a nice place, believe me. It was nast nasty, and the stench, it was, I, it's hard to explain. But, but we, um, our office initially was an abortion clinic, well-known abortion clinic, in our community, and there was a crisis pregnancy center right next door. And the abortion clinic did a booming business when they could get an abortionist. You know, he would come down from Kansas City. They just, one day a month, and they would just weren't making enough money to pay the bills. So that's why the building was up for sale. They hadn't been paying their rent. So we stepped in, bought it, and said, sorry, we're not going to retain your tenancy because um, we have other plans for the building. They didn't know it was us, by the way. <laughs> or else they wouldn't have sold it to us. But so anyway, um, at one point when it was an operating abortion clinic, there was these two little girls. They began to be sexually assaulted by their stepdad when they were 11 and 12 years old. And um, there was a pregnancy um, uh, by, I think the 12 year old had a pregnancy. They were, they were taken to that particular clinic by the stepfather, she was given an abortion, handed back to the stepfather who continued to abuse her for four more years because that abortionist did not report that child sex abuse. And um, we tried to get him disciplined for that, for failing to report. His failure to report caused those girls additional pregnancies, additional abortions. And the only way we found out about it was they came, they realized that we were no longer an abortion clinic. The girls went next door to the crisis pregnancy center and asked for help. They explained what was going on and they called the police. And so that man today is in jail for, I think 35 years he got, something like that. And, um, but the abortionist got away scot-free. He never had to pay for that. And that is a violation of the law that nobody wanted to prosecute or nobody could prosecute. Kansas was a little bit of a political, um, you know, political upheaval, you might say, back in those days. We had a very pro-life attorney general. His name was Phil Klein. And he tried very hard to prosecute Planned Parenthood for concealing child sex abuse. He filed 107 charges against the clinic in Overland Park, Kansas. And um, I cannot tell you the, the abortionists and the media got together. They spent boatloads of money to see him defeated. And um, one of the abortionists filed an ethics complaint against him. He actually lost his law license because of that. They had him in secret trials before the Supreme Court. I mean, it was just crazy. I can't even tell you. He would be glad to tell you about it. But, you know, he actually lives in Virginia and I teaches at Liberty University. Basically got run out of the state by the abortionists who lied through their teeth, made him look like he was a child abuser. They were like 
political cartoons in the newspaper with this man, Phil Klein, with his hand up a little girl's dress because he was trying to get records to ensure that all these abuse charges were being actually reported, you know, and then they make him look like he's the abuser, you know, and, and it was just a terrible thing that happened in Kansas. But, but because of the political corruption and the cover-up, he paid dearly for his attempt to try to protect these little girls and prosecute Planned Parenthood. And um, the... Um, in the meantime, you know, Planned Parenthood, the district attorney that replaced him, there was a, he, by then Phil had moved to the district attorney of this county where this Planned Parenthood was. He was replaced by another man, supposedly, supposedly a pro-life Republican, right? Who worked with the pro-life Republican attorney general at that time to dismiss the charges even though the evidence, they said, well, we can't get the evidence, the evidence is gone. And I knew where the evidence was. I'd been doing open records requests, and I had a document from a judge telling me exactly where the documents were. So I filed ethics complaints against them, and now they hate me, so. But too bad, you know? Because the people that cover up for these people need to be held accountable. That Planned Parenthood was never held accountable for anything, and that is one of our biggest um, challenges that we have right now is enforcement of the law and holding abortionists accountable for their things that we know and have documented on paper that they're doing. You know, um, then also another aspect of the abortion cartel that we also see in Planned Parenthood are the sex abusers inside of the organization. You know, think about it. Abortion clinics are places of opportunity for sexual predators. What other place can you go to work at where a woman takes off her clothes, lays on a table, and puts her legs up for it? You know what I mean? It's just, I've read documents that were practically pornographic, describing every detail when they've actually caught these guys. They had to go through that in order to get a prosecution. If they didn't tell every detail, this guy was going to get away. So it's, I have read things that curl your hair about what, Men do to women in that vulnerable position as they're slipping under the twilight sleep, under anesthesia, and are powerless to fight back. It's just absolutely appalling. I'm going to tell you about two of them. One is a man named Tim Timothy Liveright. He was actually a part-time Planned Parenthood abortionist. Um, I believe he was on Delaware. He was in Delaware. 2013. He was caught, um, accused of sexual harassment and inappropriate behavior with parent, patients. Now, inappropriate behavior with patients is a nice, polite term you can use in mixed company for the worst kind of um, sexual misconduct, okay? So he actually... Um, only received a public reprimand, and Planned Parenthood threw him under the bus. They fired him. So maybe, I don't know, is that a good thing? Probably. But um, that was only to protect their reputation, though, not because they were concerned about the women. Someone in those Planned Parenthoods where he worked knew that abuse was happening, and they covered it up. They were silent. They didn't say anything. They allowed it to happen. And I've talked to clinic workers who have said, oh, yeah, I would never let any woman be alone in the room with Dr. XYZ, whatever, because I knew what he was going to do to them. You know, it's like shocking. That is a unknown, pretty much unknown secret of the abortion cartel. The abortion cartel is, I won't say filled, but there's a great sampling of um, Planned Parenthood and other abortion clinics that have sexual predators inside their organizations taking advantage of women. That is a pet peeve of mine, and um, I worked really hard to expose that. Another man, his name was Roger Ian Hardy. He worked in um, Massachusetts at the Planned Parenthood in Boston. There were 18 witnesses that came forward and said that he sexually molested his patients while they were under anesthesia. 
And um, also during fertility treatments, that is other fertility, his day job is fertility center. And as the legal things started heating up and more women started coming forward, he actually fled the country and moved to Thailand. So he was never um, able to be held accountable because he had the means to flee the country when it got hot for him. The Boston Globe did like a two-part expose on him, which just reads like a tabloid almost. But yet, and somebody knew about that. Somebody knew about him. And they did not report. They allowed those women to suffer. And they did nothing. And so it's the veil of secrecy again, covering up the abuses so that nobody knows what's really going on. And it's really shocking. But I want to give you guys a little bit of hope. We've actually made a little bit of progress. I'm only going to talk about this briefly. Um, it, from a national sense, but everybody's aware of the undercover videos that were done by the CMP, did an excellent job exposing Planned Parenthood and the selling of aborted baby body parts, exposed their cold callousness, the way that they just could talk about dismembering, crunching, pulling, whatever, babies, and, um, and the desire to profit from that a second time. They get paid for the abortion, they wanted to get paid again, for the fetal remains. And so there was actually a pretty booming business going on there. And um, because of that, let's go back to the Missouri Planned Parenthood, worst one in America. The, there was a state senator there, his name was Kurt Schaefer, and he started an investigation of Planned Parenthood to see if they were really selling baby body parts in, in Missouri. You know, fair question. Is this happening in my state? Well, what he uncovered was a web of political corruption that was just absolutely staggering. They had um, the University of Missouri. There was an employee there who um, recruited an abortionist from the Planned Parenthood in Missouri to start working at the Planned Parenthood in Columbia, but she could not qualify for hospital privileges. So the University of Missouri issued her what they called refer and follow privileges. They, they had only ever issued two of those, and it was to elderly um, physicians who wanted to follow their patients. And it basically meant they could come in the hospital, they could check on their progress, and be told a little bit about their treatment and how they're doing. But he could not treat, he couldn't put a Band-Aid on people. And that's what the refer and follow privileges were. It would be like me saying, oh, I recommend, I'm going to refer you to the hospital because you're having some issues, I'm concerned about you, go, you should go to the hospital. And then being able to go visit your friend afterwards and find out how they're doing. I mean, that was, the, that was like the refer and follow privileges. So they, it, they sent those refer and follow privileges, which were required for abortion clinic licensure in Missouri. They sent those to the health department, very friendly health department director too, with a cover letter that mentioned these are her hospital privileges, right? Well, she said, I read the cover letter in, in testimony in front of this hearing that they had in the Missouri Senate. She goes, she goes, well, I looked at the cover letter and it said hospital privileges. So I just assumed she had full hospital privileges when I issued them the abortion license, right? And then they found out that um, it was just like such a huge cover-up that involved not only the University of Missouri, but also um, the health department and people inside the government, you know, they were like signing off on inspections that um, I think they inspected with their eyes closed, you know, because other inspections after that show gross deficiencies. And um, so that clinic, um, that all, you're not gonna believe what happened in Missouri. There was a um, group of pro-lifers that stood with these legislators and fed them information. Um, they would call me for information from time to time because we had acquired so much documentation on this particular Planned Parenthood. And um, at the end of the, um, the investigation, they were unable to determine what actually even happened to the babies. The pathologist wouldn't testify, he took the fifth. That we, they found out, the investigative committee found out that 
Planned Parenthood was sending the remains to a pathologist, and then they were ending up being illegally transported to Indiana, where they were dumped in a landfill. And so, but they could never determine whether or not fetal parts were actually sold out of there. It was just people clammed up, got lawyers, took the fifth. And so um, that was kind of the end of their investigation. But in the end, they issued a scathing report, and I just want to read for you a little bit of what that report said. It said, this level of callous disregard by Planned Parenthood of the St. Louis region for the safety of women seeking their services in an apparent effort to protect their own business model from being damaged by news of botched abortions and patients ending up in ER is shocking. This kind of deliberate organizational effort to steer patients away from medical emergency treatment may very well constitute medical malpractice and reckless endangerment of the health of patients. All of this indicated that Planned Parenthood is far more worried about their reputation, business model, and public relations efforts than they are about the women in their care. It is difficult to conceive of any other organization, let alone an organization that holds itself out as providing women's health services, being so recklessly indifferent to the health of their patients as to put such directives as those listed above in print, for use by their employees. And one of the things they would do is they would call for ambulances with no lights and no sirens. And um, earlier this year, um, the, the legislature started taking action. I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. But um, I will tell you this. The, the rabbit hole of corruption is deep. And it's unbelievable how the people that are actually involved in it. We found out through our own investigations that um, you know Planned Parenthood is a strong, has a lot of political clout, and that political clout enables them to cover up more stuff, and it enables them to be able to get a message to to the very friendly mainstream media that will just regurgitate everything they say, and even though it's fake, false. 100% lie, it doesn't matter. If whatever we say is like held in suspicion, it's like it can't be credible because it came from you. You know what I mean? So that's the way the media treats us. We're not credible because we are pro-lifers. And they are credible because they are Planned Parenthood. You know, and they, they believe me, lie through their teeth, it's all going on. But, um, there's also pro political corruption that entered this um, baby parts thing. You know, there was a big lawsuit. Troy was actually on the board of the CMP, advised during this um, whole investigation. He's been sued along with the other members of the CMP. And um, it's, it's really a serious lawsuit. The attorneys don't actually expect to win. They're in the Ninth Circuit. They picked the San Francisco Liberal judge with connections to Planned Parenthood who refuses to recuse himself. And Planned Parenthood gets everything they want. N National Abortion Federation gets everything they want. This case is going to go on forever. It's going to go on for a long time. But, but um, Troy does have a motion. He's represented by the ACLJ, Jay Sekulow, and Ed White, excellent attorneys. You guys all know who they are. And um, they had submitted a brief to the Supreme Court to overturn a gag order because this judge had put a gag order on these people and said, you are not allowed to release any more videos, even to law enforcement, and even if it, commit, if it holds evidence of crimes, you cannot submit it to law enforcement. And so we believe that gag order is really over the top to protect Planned Parenthood. I mean, what judge would say that? Sorry, but you can't tell law enforcement, you can't provide them evidence of crimes being committed. You know, you are enjoined, and if you break that, you'll be held in contempt of court. We're going to put you in the jailhouse. We're going to fine you, fine you, you know, big fines. And so the, it's just ridiculous. So we're waiting. The 26th, we should hear whether or not the Supreme Court decides to hear that. Are we done? Yeah. Did I miss the five minutes? Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't see the, I didn't see the sheet of paper. I didn't see a sheet of paper. Okay, well, I'm just going to end it there, but I am going to say this. There is hope. 
in, the, in Missouri, they passed a boatload of laws. It's prevented two clinics from opening that Planned Parenthood was trying to expand into. Um, some of those um, provisions of those laws were things that Operation Rescue advised them to include. And so we're pretty proud of that. We're proud of the people of Missouri. They're fighting back. They're, they're really taking it back to Planned Parenthood. They're not letting them get away with it. They have a new health department director. He's saying, sorry, but I'm, I'm enforcing the law from here on out, enforcing the law. So um, I'm sorry that I'm too wordy and that I talk too long. <laughs> and I did not see the paper. They were going to hold up a paper. I'm like looking around. Is that okay? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you.